Okay guys, in this video we're going to go into chapter 8, which is all about sharing of electrons and all about molecules, okay? So, if you and your, you know, sibling both want to have the same toy, you know, what do mom and dad always say? They say, hey, you got to share, okay? I have two little kids at home, I think I see, use the word share probably 110 times every single day with my two little boys. So, that's what molecules are all about, in chapter 8 it's all about, is how do we get these different atoms to share electrons to become more stable. Okay, so to do that, we're dealing with molecules here. So molecules is the word we use for sharing of electrons. Now, they do not ionize, but instead they get this stable configuration by doing some sharing. Okay, as a result, we get these lower melting points from this. Okay, so if you remember, when we first started talking about ionic compounds and metals uh, as alloys, that they formed this nice repeating pattern or this kind of rigid uh, crystal lattice. Well, molecules don't do that. Okay, they do form solids and they do are do are held together by something called an intermolecular force, but they do not have as organized or structured repeating patterns. So as a result, um, they tend to break apart easier. Now it doesn't mean the bonds themselves are weak. It just means that from one molecule to the next, there isn't as much stuff holding it together. Okay, so as a result, they have a lower melting point. Now, what's interesting about molecules is they do not conduct electricity when in solution. So when ionic compounds dissolve into solution, so here's what we see happen. So if we take something like sodium chloride, the NaCl, if that dissolves into solution, we get sodium ions plus we get chlorine ions. Okay? So these are now floating around in water. And as a result, we have charge here, we have charge here, and if you have mobile charge or movement of charge, you can conduct electricity. Now, when something, let's say, like glucose or sugar, so C6H12O6, when that dissolves in water, what happens is, if you have a whole bunch of these, when they dissolve, they just dissolve into the water, but they don't break apart. So we still get C6H12O6 as a group in water. There are no ions here. Okay? So because there's no, no ions when put into water, we don't have any mobile charge. If there's no mobile charge, they cannot conduct electricity in solution. Okay? So whereas ionic compounds break into ions in solution, um, molecules do not. What happens with molecules is that they just, sep into, they just break apart into separate packets of C6H12O6 or so forth. So they don't actually break apart into any ions in that, in that case. Okay? So as we take a look at this idea of, well, what is a molecule? How do we identify that? The way we do that is you need to have two nonmetals bonded together, okay? So we're dealing with that upper right-hand side of our periodic table. Actually, a very few number of elements make molecules because of that upper right-hand corner. There's not as many there. But because they can form in different ratios, we still have a lot of molecules in our world. So when we start looking at molecules, one thing that we have to kind of make a note of is how do they bond or where, where does this bonding occur, what goes on between the two different atoms. For ionic compounds, it's kind of easy to identify because for an ionic compound, you have a transfer of electrons and then what holds them together is the positive charge and that negative charge. So we get this charge attraction. Well, there is no charge attraction for molecules, so what holds them together is what we're kind of looking at here. And to do that, we need to have a bond, okay? And that bond, we call it a covalent bond. Now, what happens is, if you take a look at a typical um, atom, we have in its outer energy level, or the valence energy level, we have these S and P orbitals, okay? So if I take something that's, say, like carbon, okay, and we go to carbon, um, carbon has... Uh, electron configuration of 1s, 2, 2s, well, my s's are bad, 2, 2p6, oh, not of that, it's actually 2p2. So it's 2p2, okay? So in its second energy level, in the s and p orbitals, we have a total of four electrons for carbon, or basically four valence electrons. Now, these four valence electrons, they fall in an S-shaped orbital and a P-shaped orbital, okay? Which is fine when it's by itself, but when it starts to bond, these orbitals no longer exist, okay? Because it's no longer just a single carbon floating around by itself. It's now interacting with another atom. So as a result, what happens on our different... Uh, molecules is that we get a new type of orbital. We call it a hybrid orbital. And around carbon, with, and any other atom actually, what that generates is four 
different possible regions that it can bond, okay? These four regions are identical in shape. Um, they're just called a hybrid orbital. And now we can create or sharing of electrons in any of these four different regions here, okay? So for carbon, since carbon has a total of four valence electrons inside of it, okay, it can actually put one electron in each of these locations, so it allows it to bond up to four different places. So every atom kind of bonds a little differently, but they're, for all of them, they have a, a possible of four bonds, basically, or finding four bonding locations that they're able to, uh, to work with, okay? So these different locations are now all equal. They're equal shape, and we have possible four. Not all atoms do four bonds. Some do one, some do two, some do three, up to four, but we have a possibility of up to four to kind of work with. For most atoms, that is, all right? So as we go through this, to get an idea of well, where are these locations going to be and how do we identify what's the primary way things are going to bond, we need to get into something called electron dot structures, or basically what we sometimes call Lewis dot structures. And to do that, we first need to figure out, well, how do we show these valence electrons on the outside of an atom, okay? So if we take a look at this periodic table that's been condensed down, we see what we call the electron dot structures, where these little dots going around the outside of the different atoms. Now if you look close, each one of these atoms, the dots represent how many valence electrons they have. So I'm going to focus on nitrogen here um, and kind of work you through how do we get it to look like this. So nitrogen, first thing we need to know is that nitrogen has five valence electrons on it. Okay, and you can do that a couple different ways. You can do its electron configuration, or you can just count to the right and know it's in group 15, so it has five, however you remember that. But at this point in the year, we should be able to say that nitrogen has five valence electrons on its outer energy level. Okay, now when we do a dot structure, we kind of imagine that the element is in a box, and there's four sides to that box that represent those four different bonding locations that it can have. So what happens is the electrons start to fill in these four different sites. And very much like electron configurations before, you always want to put one electron in each site before you pair them up. Okay, so for nitrogen, since it has five electrons, we're going to put one on each side of it to give it four. But then now what we want to do is we want to uh, let me make these a little bit bigger for you guys. Okay, what we want to do is put that fifth one on. Okay, so in the picture on the screen, we see that it has, you know, the fifth one got paired up here. It doesn't matter where you pair it up, but one of these four quadrants needs to have a pair. So I'm going to put it on the bottom. This is, that's where I kind of like it. Okay, so we end up with five electrons around the nitrogen. We have one, two, and if you look at it, we end up having one on each side and one is paired up. Or if we kind of write the final result of this, we get nitrogen with one on each side and a pair at the bottom. So this would be its electron dot structure right there. Now what's nice is when you do this, we notice that the side that's been paired up, go back to this kind of image here, the side that's been paired up, this is less likely to be a bonding location now because there's already a pair. Where the other three are locations where we're kind of missing an electron to get to that magic number of eight. So these are locations where we're more likely going to have bonds attached to nitrogen. So nitrogen is going to be more likely to bond in three places. Whereas if we take a look at carbon, it's more likely to have four. Oxygen, more likely to have two. Fluorine, more likely to have one. Neon, because they're all paired, again, it's stable. It has eight. It's not going to really bond. Okay. You go over here to our ionic compounds, or our metals, I should say, that form ionic compounds. Even if they started to pair things up, they're missing so many electrons on the outer energy level that it really doesn't work for them to share. So instead, they just give away their electrons in ionic bonding, so that way they can come, become stabilized. So we're really, these just kind of show how it wouldn't work to share very well for metals. But for your nonmetals, there's a way that we can actually do some sharing that works out pretty well. We'll get to boron later on in this unit. It's kind of a goofy one as we do that. Okay? So... The last thing we want to talk about is when you're doing this sharing of electrons, how do we represent that or how do we show that, okay? To do that is through what we call a covalent bond, okay? 
Now, when we have covalent bonds, we can share either two, four, or six electrons. So if you're going to share just two electrons, we call that a single covalent bond, and we represent that by just a single line or a single bar. If you have four electrons being shared, we call that a double covalent bond, and we use two bars. If we have six, we call that a triple covalent bond, and we have three bars. Okay. So the next step in this process is to take this idea of the dots we've been doing and these bars now and actually start to draw up or build molecules so using something called a Lewis dot structure. Okay. So we're going to end the video here, and we're going to start uh, the in-class session on how to build Lewis dot structures based off the knowledge that we kind of did in the video. Thank you.